Today is a, a little bit long talk, but not actually a long talk, it's a short talk. It is basically rethinking the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis, which governs and then underlying mechanisms, novel diagnostic protocols, and alternative treatment options for male hypogonadism. Some of you maybe are using those novel options, some of you are not, and some of may be entirely new. So, hopefully you all can learn something. Now, financial disclosure, I do have some in, uh, <clears throat> interest in a couple of companies. Mr. Uh, Gerler does not. This will be an overview, a little bit about male hypogonadism, but not to the degree as you've heard before from other speakers. There will be more of an emphasis on the hypothalamic pituitary axis. There will be diagnostic protocols about this axis and it's dis not dysfunction, but disruption because I like the word disruption. That was a word used by Dr. Schaunder Bessine, one of the top 10 androgen testosterone researchers in the world as far as I'm concerned, professor of endocrinology at Boston University. He's written seminal papers on superphysiological testosterone in young men up to 600 milligrams per week and even in older men. We will also discuss the novel intervention of raising endogenous internal testosterone without using the ne a needle or other gel and so on to get your own axis working to correct or modify the disruption. The objective is to look at and find the site and it's most, we're talking about mostly healthy aging men, not men who are like bedridden or so on. Or, and we're gonna learn the novel methods to raise the T without the exogenous T administration. I hope you come home with that information. Overview of male hypogonadism, no need to go into that. However, strictly speaking, this is the endocrine society position about hypogonadism. First of all, it's a clinical syndrome. Syndrome is an important word. Syndrome doesn't mean just a number. It's a complex of numbers and symptoms. Please remember, you're not treating numbers. You're treating a person. And <clears throat> with a failure of the testes to produce physiological levels of testosterone. Now, what are physiological levels of testosterone? Does anybody in the audience know that? How much does a male produce, normal male, young male, per day? Any ideas? Roughly five to seven milligrams per day, which, counts, which goes to 35 to 49 milligrams. That's roughly the physiological production. And this is now, when we look at this disruption at one or more levels of the hypothalamic pituitary axis with the syndrome of low testosterone physiological levels, we have hypogonadism. That is the official endocrinology society statement. What is the prevalence? I mean, how much is there out there? Well, different places have different um, let's say statistics, data. Now the data that I like, it comes from A-B-A-R-A-U-G-H-O. He is the man behind M-M-A-S, which is the Male Massachusetts Aging Study. He's done multiple papers over long term looking at males as they age in the Massachusetts Boston area. Now, <clears throat> When you look at the, uh, a sample of men at 1,475, ages 30 to 97, 70, 97, 79, with the clinical criteria of symptomatic hypogonadism, there's a low testosterone under 300 nanograms per deciliter and a free testosterone of less than five nanograms per deciliter. Plus, you must have low libido 
Now, this is interesting about hypogonadism. When you ask a person, what is the presenting symptoms of hypogonadism, the first thing. Hypogonadism would be, for hypogonadism, libido is really important. Sexual interest, sexual function, motivation, physical activity. That was from the Endocrine Society, actually a little booth there in Houston last, uh, actually it was in June, where you went through this uh, little quiz. So, but in addition to this, you could have also following symptoms such as sleep disturbance, but that's not always universal, but I've seen men who have low testosterone sweat. Sweating is a tip-off for low testosterone. Uh, you could have depressed mood. Depression is also a tip-off. But depression, it comes in many flavors and forms. So we cannot use that as one criteria. But there's several criteria being used by the clinical endocrine society. Lethargy, decreased sleep, physical performance. I mean, guys want to go to the gym, but they don't go to the gym. They know they want to go, but they just can't get it going. Now, this study showed that if you looked at the overall number of men in this group, it was about 5.6 to 6 percent in that range had a degree of hypogonadism based upon the criteria we discussed. Uh, then the men under 70 was somewhere between 3 to 7 percent. If you're over 70 percent, it goes up to 18 percent. So, as you get older, it goes up a little bit. Then, what is most important here, we have an aging population, that we are at 2012, which is 13 years from now, it is predicted that 6.5 million men, new men, were going to develop symptomatic androgen deficiency syndrome. So we're going to have a hell of a lot of men out there with low testosterone. And that means like a 38 to 40 percent increase from the year 2000. What does that mean for the pharmaceutical industry? A lot. That's why you see some strange forms out there of testosterone gels, which you apply under your arm, which is the ax axion for testa, which is put in between your legs. Kind of a strange place to do it because that's where a lot of dihydrotestosterone conversion takes place because it will be close to the scrotum. So there is a market, and there's a huge market, and it's a growing market. Okay. Next, uh, Mr. Gerler will talk a little bit more about the different studies on prevalence of low testosterone hypogonadism. Thank you, Dr. Ulis, and uh, we're going to kind of trade back and forth uh, throughout the presentation. Um, this was a recent pu uh, paper that was published in the uh, International Journal of Endocrinology by some of the giants in the field as far as uh, male hypogonadism goes, and it's a little bit messy, so I'm going to highlight some of the points from these studies individually. Um, the European Male Aging Study was uh, cross-sectional. Um, it was over 3,000 men, and their overall prevalence was 2.1%. Um, however, um, and, and a lot of the big studies, depending on uh, cofactors of, of you know, illness, or there was a lot of variables that, that were taken into account with some of these numbers. But just to put some general figures, their overall was 2.1 percent, and um, with not surprising, there was an increasing prevalence with coexisting illnesses and BMI increases. The, uh, the next was the Baltimore Longitudinal Study of Aging. And that was taken from samples of over about roughly 44 years, almost 1,000 men. Um, it was a very large study. And their overall incidence of hypogonadism was approximately 20 percent of men in their 60s, 30 percent in their 70s, and up to 50 percent of men in their 80s. And a little bit later in the presentation, we'll, we'll discuss some of the mechanisms behind that. Uh, the following study was the Male Massachusetts Aging Study. And it was another longitudinal study. Um, over 1,600 men, their prevalence of androgen deficiency at baseline was about 6, 6 percent, 6 to 12 percent, and there was uh, testosterone declines with, associated with aging, um, approximately uh, 10 percent per decade, and these are, these are pretty common 
uh, statistics by now an approximately 23.8 percent decline in free testosterone which is even more important and um, one of the reasons behind that is there's a corresponding increase in sex hormone binding globulin that happens with aging as well. Uh, finally the Boston Area Community Health Survey was almost 1500 men and um, Dr. Euless highlighted some of this data in the previous slide and their, their prevalence again was overall prevalence was 5.6 percent and then uh, roughly 3 to 7 percent in men less than 70 and, and men over 70 it jumped up to about 18 and a half percent.